In Psalm 59, verses 16 to 17, it says, But I will sing of your strength and will joyfully proclaim your faithful love in the morning. For you have been a stronghold for me, a refuge in my day of trouble. To you, my strength, I sing praises, because God is my stronghold, my faithful God. So we have got the pleasure of having Esther come and share her faith story today. So come on up, Esther. And just for a moment, maybe Gustavo and Caleb, you could stand for a moment as well. You remember these two guys, they shared their faith story as well. Uh, going to school in Puerto Rico at a Baptist college, but from Peru. Uh, you can go ahead and have a seat. Thank you, guys. Uh, this is their last week that they're going to be around to be with us. And so we thank you so much. And now, guys, I don't have it today, but we do have just a, a little bit of a going away gift that I need to get to you, all right? So now that I've told you that, you're going to really want to make sure to connect with me at some point, okay? So Esther, would you come and share how God has been working in your life? Thank you so much. Um, good morning, Cornerstone. My name is Esther. Um, 
I'm going to try to share my faith story in English. It's my first time doing it, so forgive me if I make mistakes. Um, I was born in Peru. My parents are missionaries. They have been in Peru for 30 years now, by the grace of God. Um, I had the privilege to be born in a Christian family. That was a blessing. But being born in a Christian family doesn't mean that you have the salvation for granted. That's what I thought until I was like 12 years old. I remember one day talking to my mom in my dad's office and she just started talking to me about the salvation and how God, Jesus died for me and I knew I needed that gift, the salvation. And on January 23 of 2015, I received Jesus Christ as my personal savior. After that, I remember, <laughs> after that, um, two years later, I surrendered my life to God on a um, conference in Mexico, but I forget about that, but you know, God doesn't forget all the promises we made to him. Um, years later, I remember it wasn't perfect all my high school. I made some mistakes, but God always was there for me. When I finished high school, I remembered that I needed to make some choices to see where I was going to go. If I was, I was going to go to a Bible college or what, a, what, a, what a, I was going to do with my life. I remember I, at first I didn't want to go to a Bible college at all. I was nervous and I didn't want to go. But I wanted to do my will and my plans. That was selfish of me, right? But God always make sure that I knew that I have surrendered my life to him and that now my life didn't belong to me, but it belonged to Jesus now. Um, I remember after that, that one day I just started talking to my dad about not wanting to go to a Bible college, but then he just said to me, just try it. Try it for one year. If you don't like it, you can come back. It's okay. And I said, okay, I'm going to pray and I'm going to Think about it. I started praying, and then God put in my heart the, the feeling to go to a Bible college. And when I signed the papers to go to Puerto Rico Baptist College, I remember signing those papers and saying, God, I really don't know what you're going to do with me. I'm not sure if you can do something with me, but here I am. Like I told you, I surrender my life to you, and here I am. Just do your will in me. And then I'm here. After two years in college, I'm here. And I can tell you it has been a good choice for me. And I'm just so glad. And I'm, I'm so blessed because God has been so good with me. And he has shown me, um, even with my parents, he has shown me that the will of God will never take you, but his grace cannot keep you. He has been faithful with me. And I'm just so thankful, thankful to be here today. Thank you. Have Gustavo and Caleb come, want to pray for them. Luis, you want to join me and uh, just, just come up here. I won't make you talk or anything. You don't have to have anything planned, right? He's going to ministry, though, so, you know, he's got to be used to these uh, spontaneity calls, so it's okay. I just want to pray over the three of you, okay? Father God, I thank you so much for Caleb and Gustavo, for Esther. Lord, for the way that you are working in their lives we thank you for their faith story. God, we thank you for the way that we are encouraged. And Father, for all of us just to know that that prayer that Esther had, I can't imagine a better prayer than just saying, Lord God, here I am. Use me as you want to. Um, and so I thank you for these young people who are willing to do that. Encourage them, help them to get the funds that they need as they go back to school. Help them to be prepared for the next school year. God, to be filled up by their experience here this summer in Pipestone, Minnesota, so very, very far away from home. Lord, thank you for the life that they have brought to us as well. In your name, amen. Amen. Sobre la 
It's good to see all of you here today. If I by chance look a little bit rough or green around the gills, I think I had food poisoning last night. So if you think I look bad now, you should see me at midnight. It was not pretty, but uh, doing okay. God gave me strength. So here we are. I want to start just by thanking Esther for, uh, there she is. I was like, she's not there. She disappeared. She's way in the back. Thanks Esther for helping back there too. Uh, thank you for sharing your story. Appreciate it. And again, like with Gustavo as well, first time sharing in English. My goodness. Well, well done. Very good. So thank you for sharing your story. Blessings to y'all. So Marnie and I just got back from two weeks of vacation. Our first week was a week of staycation, working on windows in our house and working on fireplace, because I want to try and get those winter bills down a little bit, all of that stuff. Uh, but then we did get to go away for a week, and we saw our daughter Ashley and our son-in-law Connor we, to, in the Chicago area, Woodstock, Illinois. And while there, we got to go to uh, the Chicago Institute of Art, I think is the way it is, Chicago Institute of Art. That was amazing. We got to go to the Milwaukee Burner Botanical Garden. Just things that are good for our souls. So thank you for that time off. And thanks to Cody for preaching the first week and for Ryan the second week. Appreciate that much. If you look at the title of the message for today, Life of Worship, and if you by chance know where we're going in Romans 11, we're going to be at Romans 11:33 to 12:21. You might know that somewhere in there it talks about it talks about therefore uh, giving our bodies over to be living sacrifices. And if you know that part of scripture, that's what I am going to be preaching on. But I am not going to be surprised at all if you hear this and go, "Well, that was a different take on that passage," because I don't know if you're like me, but I have heard the, some of these passages and some of these uh, sermons quite often. One of the things that I personally like to do when I am reading scripture, and I would encourage you to do this as well, that is to ask, what am I missing? Or what am I just kind of taking for granted? All right? And I want to take a look at something that I think we kind of take for granted in this passage that might open up a whole new realm for us to see God in, in, in some new ways. So, um, that's kind of where we're going. Usually this passage is focusing on living sacrifice, which we're going to touch on a little bit. But you think about, well, that's strange, living sacrifice, well, I thought a sacrifice was being put to death, but God's calling us to be living sacrifices, that all of our life would be geared to worshiping Him and serving Him as He calls. Let's pray, and then we're going to jump in, okay? So, Father God in heaven, again, I just want to thank you for our brothers and sisters of Nuevo Vida and Jesus. Lord, I thank you, as, as Ryan said too, that two churches come together, but really what we know is we are one church. And we give you praise together. And Father, I thank you for your Holy Spirit being present with us right now, meeting us right where we are. Some of us have 
come out of a really great week and others have come out of a really difficult week. Some of us were sick at midnight last night. But you meet us where we are. And we give you praise for that. And Lord, when we read the words today, which you directed for Paul to write almost 2,000 years ago, Lord, help us to see that they are just as relevant for us right now. And help us to see, Lord, the treasure that we have in Christ. And to know the purpose for which we have been created. To live out that which is going to bring great glory and purposeful satisfaction in being yours. Lord, I just know that a lot of us will sometimes mistakenly get off track and think that we are living for our own happiness or for the American dream. And Lord, we know those things are just a hollow representation of why you created us in your image. And so, Lord Jesus, we ask you to speak directly and clearly to us this morning and set our eyes on what really matters. May our joy be found in your joy. In your name, amen. All right, so let's look at Romans 11, 33 through chapter 12, verse 21. Now, the way that we're going to tackle this today is I'm actually only going to read 11.33 to 12.3 to start. The bulk of the sermon is on those verses. And then, with what comes out of that, I'm going to read the rest of Romans 12. And that's just going to preach itself. Okay? Also, if you come each and every week and you pay close attention, then you'll notice that I've kind of skipped over 9, 10, and most of 11. You might be thinking, well, what happened in 9, 10, and 11? We're going to come back to those later on. But 9, 10, and 11 are kind of a parentheses of sorts in which Paul is directly addressing Israel and who is Israel and we want to, we got a lot that we can talk about in that, but it would take us off track of what we're trying to get out of the promises, prescriptions, and paths of Romans and Corinthians, okay? So we'll come back to this parentheses of 9 through 11 down the road and cover some things, okay? All right, so follow along with me as I read starting... At Romans chapter 11, verse 33. Oh, the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and untraceable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Or who has ever first given to him that is to God and has to be repaid by God? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this age, but be, be, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, perfect will of God. For the, by, by the grace given to me, I tell everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he should think. Instead, think sensibly as God has distributed a measure of faith to each one. So now, if you're one of those people like me who likes to underline or make notes in your Bibles, I would say, right now, just put a little line or a mark by, oh, the depths of the riches. That's in verse 33. Then jump down to verse 2 of Romans 12, renewing of your mind. Put a little mark there. And then in Verse 3, not to think of himself more highly than he should think. Those are going to be some main components of what we're going to look at today. 
Now I've heard over the years quite a few different sermons preached on presenting your bodies as a living, sac living sacrifice. They're good, they've been solid, and I appreciate them dearly. But the focus is typically on living sacrifices. And here's what I started to understand, what I felt like God was showing me this week is the living sacrifice part is what comes out of what is the true focus. So the true focus is going to be those verses 11.33 through 36 because that holds the focus. And then what follows in Romans chapter 12, well, that's just an outpouring of what's being seen and immersed in these four verses of chapter 11. So here's the background very quickly. In, in chapters 9 through 11, Paul focuses in on Israel. And he is heartbroken over how the majority of Israel, the majority of Israel are religious, but without the gospel of Jesus Christ. And these are his kinsmen. And his heart breaks for them. And he's concerned for them. And he goes through, as you'll see down the road, we're going to be talking about it. He's talking about how not everybody who is descendants of Abraham or Israel, not all Israel is, is Israel is what he's saying. And he's broken over this. But then towards the end of chapter 11, God gives him insight to see that the mess of Israel is being used so that Gentiles can be brought into the kingdom. And by the fact that the Gentiles are being brought into the kingdom, Israel is going to be jealous. And those who are for foreknowledge of their salvation, those people are going to want to come in and have what the Gentiles have. And now what happens at the end of chapter 11 is Paul realizes God's sovereign plan. And he is amazed by this sovereign plan. Two weeks ago, Cody preached on God's sovereignty. And I, I thanked Cody for that. It was a hard sermon that he preached. I'll tell you what. Well, well when he said he was going to preach on the sovereignty of God, the providence of God, I said, boy, you're biting off a lot, aren't you? He's like, well, I felt God's leading me to it. I'm glad God led him to it. Here is a very good example of what seems to be a mess that God is using for his own glory. And so Paul, recognizing this, has this awestruck moment, an aha moment. And what we'll see here in these first few, few verses of 33 to 36, he finds himself in a similarity to what Isaiah experienced and to what Job experienced. And we know that because these words that are recorded in 33 to 36, well, those are little snippets out of Isaiah and Job. So Paul brings those in. And he has this little hymn. And as he is awestruck, because now he sees God for God, this little hymn begins with a little word. Oh. Oh. <laughs> the depths of the riches of God, the treasure of God, his wisdom, his knowledge. Oh. Oh is an exclamation of either surprise or shock or pain or awe. I think this is one of those words that we read over it way too quickly. Like when I just read it, I purposefully just read, oh, and kept going, because I think that's how we usually read it. Where do you think that word comes from? I did some study because there's really not very good entomology of where did O oh come from. However, in a lot of languages, including Greek, O is used. 
In, in Greek, the, the, the letter for omega is used in there. But where do you think it's derived from? Here's one of the dictionaries that I read talking about it. Said it comes from a very peculiar and guttural sound. And it even says that the letter O was probably designed, you know that little circle that we have for an O? Probably designed because of our lips. O. Right? Here's what's interesting. Think of a word like literature. Well, that word is something that we had to conceive and put together and we used other parts of other words and we built it. O comes out of what I would suggest to you is an uncontrollable body reaction to surprise or shock or pain. Oh. If something happens, sometimes it's just, oh. The, 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 the lungs compress, our body tenses, and it pushes air out. And if our voice box kicks in, we say, oh. I think that happened when I went to the Grand Canyon, and I walked up and I saw it for the first time, and I was just, oh. It wasn't a word that had to be designed. A word just came out of this reaction. Oh. How many of you have seen National Treasure, the movie? Few of you? Okay, few of you seen National Treasure. Now, maybe you think of another movie, but I'm thinking of this one in particular. In National Treasure, there's a point towards the end of the movie where these four people walk into this room which you can't even see the vast expanse of the room at, at the beginning. They walk into this room and they see the treasure. And it starts off, they're just kind of breathless. But then this young lady walks over to this shelf and she kind of squats down and looks and you hear her go, oh. Scrolls from the Library of Alexandria. It was like this uncontrollable, oh. I think we need to read this sentence like that. Look back there again if you're not still there. Oh, the depth of the riches of God. Oh takes your breath away. Paul sees God for God and he brings in Isaiah. And if you haven't read Isaiah 6, you should look at Isaiah 6 and see how Isaiah experiences God when he sees God for God. Uh, this isn't from Isaiah 6 in these little verses here, but think of Job. Job, when uh, when his friends have told him all the things that he should do and curse God and die and all of that, and then God speaks and says, where were you when I created all of this? Where were you when I told the water it could only come so far? Where were you? And Job sees, and I think if we were in that place, in that position where we got to be Isaiah in the throne room of God or we are with Job hearing the voice of God, I think it would be more than, eh. I think it would be, oh, oh the glory of God. And guys, this word in this place, which we just read over so quickly, I believe at the heart is Paul in worship. Why worship? Could you imagine for a moment walking into that room full of gold? Now just imagine for a moment, this is you. You are walking in. You discover it. You light up this trench of fire and you see gold everywhere. And you know that as the finder of this, the wealth is incredible. Do you think you might have a realization of, oh, 
See, here's the thing. Why would you do that? Because you understand the worth, the value, and the difference it makes. And at the heart of worship is what we call worth-ship. We see God for God. And we understand the value of God. And so Paul, in his greatest (laughs) expression of worship, is just, oh, the depth, the treasure. And guys, that treasure in that room pales in comparison to the depth of the treasure that we have in God. Just pales in comparison. Nothing on this planet has value like our God. My commentary that I was reading made comment to this and just said, we ought to always feel and sense, oh, when we know or hear of the gospel. The gospel should cause oh to happen, worship to happen. Hey friends, that's just the first line, actually the first word. Therefore, brothers, by the mercy of God, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. The act of worship, this becoming a living sacrifice, pours out from the depth of the riches of God. And when you recognize God for God, you will worship. How unsearchable, so then Paul, Paul is just gonna bring up some expressions of Isaiah and Job that speak to this. How unsearchable are God's judgments and untraceable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God? and has to be repaid. The point there is that whether it's Isaiah or Job, because they see God for God, the primary point is a reality check that God is God and I am not. And that puts us in our place. Now we are created in his image, which is beautiful and amazing, but God is God. Can you see him? See, if you continue to go on in verse 36, you read, for from him, that means he is a source of all things. Everything you need, that breath that you take, is from him. Know this about him. And through him, he is the agent by which all things exist and by which all things are sustained. Know this about him. And to him are all things. In other words, he is the ultimate end for why all things exist is for his glory. Know this about him. And now take that and connect it to what it says in verse two, renew your mind. How do you renew your mind? You remember who God is. You remember the O. You remember that it's from him and through him and to him. And that sets you in your heart and mind where you need to be and humbles us. And if you know the passage Isaiah is speaking of in this little clip here, what you'll know is that this is a time where Israel needs to be comforted. And Isaiah sees who God is and sees, well, if this is our God, then we're okay. And with Job, to realize God is sovereign and in control. To him be the glory forever, amen. He alone is to be worshiped, which came out in that song earlier. So we are called to be living sacrifices. That means that we need to align ourselves with 
who God is for who God is. To behold him. That's our promise. That's our prescription. That's our path. What we have just read. Um, and actually, there's going to be one more song in Spanish at the end here. And the song is called Behold. And even if you can't understand all those lyrics, take time to just close your eyes and behold God in that worship. Our worship can be in song. Our worship can be in prayer. But if you read what's going on here, we are to worship with everything and every one that we are or who we are. Everything that I am should worship. Everything that I live for, everything I do, everything I say, every way I act or react should be to the glory of God. But that's not going to happen unless I get the oh. What I'm getting at is this. If we have sin problems, which we all have had and maybe do, sin problems stem from worship problems. If we don't see God for God, and if we don't understand the oh, then we struggle more with the sin. And I would add to, to it this. If we are having worship problems, that's coming because of a pride problem. And that's why it says, and that's why I had you underline, do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought. Humility and seeing God for God and me for me causes worship, which causes transformation. Worship changes us. God knew that. All right, I'm going to read the rest of Romans 12 and let it speak to you, and then the worship team can come up. Therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Why? Because of the O. Holy and pleasing to God, this is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind. Remember the O, oh, remember from him, through him, to him, so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. For by the grace given to me, I tell everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he should think. Instead, think sensibly, as God has distributed a measure of faith to each one. Now, as we have many parts in one body and all the parts do not have the same function, in the same way, we who are many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. According to the grace given to us, we have different gifts. And so out of the O, oh, out of the worship, if you are given a gift of prophecy, use it according to the standard of one's faith. If you are given the gift of service, then use it in service. If teaching, in teaching. If exhorting, in exhortation. If giving, then do so with generosity. If leading, then do so with diligence. Show mercy with cheerfulness. Love must be without hypocrisy, detest evil, cling to what is good, show family affection to one another with brotherly love, outdo one another in showing honor, do not lack diligence. By the way, is anybody seeing some prescriptions here? Right? These are prescriptions. Here's what we do. Be fervent in spirit, serve the Lord, rejoice in hope, be patient in affliction, be persistent in prayer, share with the saints in their needs, pursue hospitality, bless those who persecute you, bless, do not curse, rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep, be in agreement with one another, 
Do not be proud. Instead, associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Try to do what is honorable in everyone's eyes. If possible, on your part, live at peace with everyone. Friends, do not avenge yourselves. Instead, leave room for his wrath. For it is written, vengeance belongs to me. I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For in so doing, you'll be heaping fiery, co fiery coals on his head. Do not be conquered by evil, but conquer evil with good. Guys, I believe all of that comes out of the, oh, my God. I see God for God. And I can't help but worship. And I can't worship, I can't worship him without also seeing that he has a plan for his people. And he cares for his people. And he calls me to serve his people. Out of the O. So in that light, I believe the overarching practical prescription for us is do not think of yourself more highly than you should think. In other words, see God for who God is and love his people the way he loves them. All of life should be lived in worship. Worship team, come on up. And we will close with a couple of songs. We're going to continue on um, in the next couple of weeks with this same theme. And uh, I just invite you to come back. It's good to have you all here this morning. Thank you once again for you guys helping us out. Sure appreciate it. Love having you here. And Caleb and Gustavo and Esther. There she is again. Okay. Thank you so much. We, we just want to share our love with you. And thank you so much that you're here with us.